Okay. Whew. After listening to Steve talk, I always feel like my brain cells get a little bit exercised. So it's fun because this is how we normally, if you weren't in his talk, this is literally how we talk all the time in our household. So it's normal for me to be constantly having conversations about things like cancer and mitochondrial function and endocannabinoid system. That is literally a discussion around a cup of coffee in the morning. So thank you all for being here, for putting up with uh, an early Saturday morning with all of us when it's gorgeous outside. Part of the longevity conversation we're gonna have today is that hopefully we'll all get outdoors to help ensure our own longevity here in a moment. Before I dive any further, is this the guy I pushed this, the thingies with? Thank you. So again, my name is Nasha, and a lot of you might have heard me speaking around things around in a, integrative oncology. It was really fun for me to hear Dawn today. I've heard her speak many times, and I really love her thought processes and her approach. In fact, I refer a lot of clients to her today, so it was a good treat for me. I missed some of the talks um, earlier in this week, coming in late. I really wish I could have seen um, Dan Party's talk on um, Thursday which was all about circadian rhythm, because that definitely weaves into our conversation today. And I also will be talking a bit about um, other elements that are presented at this conference today. So now that I know what everyone else has talked about, I might deviate a little bit from my slides, but hey, what Don was talking about this morning, what I'm gonna talk about is about adaptability and flexibility. So roll with me, everybody. So disclosures, I have a crazy little book that I thought I wrote for my mom and a couple patients and apparently a few other people have enjoyed it as well, which makes me happy. Um, I do a couple affiliates and I do some medical consulting with a, a medical device team. We are gonna define longevity. We're going to talk about the factors impacting your expiration date. And we're going to talk about different ways to enhance our longevity. So where I normally start with a lot of the conferences where I get to present and very wide variety, like this is really a fun one for me. It's more like just talking to a bunch of friends around a dinner party um, versus some of the extremely medical environments or the extreme patient um, environments. So this is, uh, this is just like hanging out with my tribe. So thank you for that. So when I ask this question of you, I sort of already have an expectation of what the answer will be in this room compared to maybe other rooms that I'm in front of. But how many of you think that you're healthy? Like really, every level of your being think that you're in optimal health. Awesome. And I noticed a few hands are like, mm, and that's how it should be, right? Because I think there's always room for more. More improvement, more knowing ourselves, more diving deeper. It's, it's a continuum. In fact, I tell people if I was perfectly healthy, I'm probably gonna be done. I'll probably just like evaporate into you know, stardust at that point. So I kind of like having a project to constantly work on, to constantly look under the hood around, to kind of a living um, laboratory, an example of that for my own longevity, and now I'll try to help other people extend their longevity as well. But I love this definition of health because it's one that we have a medical system that we call health care, and yet it has nothing to do with health, right? It's disease care or disease management at best. And so when we think Oh, hello. Okay, <laughs> good morning. Um, so when I think about the definition here, health as a condition of being sound in mind, body, and spirit, this is out of Webster's. This is not a crazy naturopathic woo-woo story. Or the general condition of the body. And notice that, the general condition, implying that this is a natural state of being, as well as a flourishing condition, well beyond just lack of symptoms. So when I really talk to people about when they assume they're healthy, it's because maybe they're not on 10 pharmaceuticals, or maybe because they don't have a label of a diagnosis laid upon them. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy. Because as someone who works with cancer, I will tell you 100% of the time, my patients will say to me, but I was healthy until I was diagnosed with cancer. And hopefully after this talk, you will realize that's just impossible, okay? So where we're gonna start with this is the Merriam-Webster's definition of Longevity, a long duration of individual life and continuance. And this idea of permanence, but durability as well. So we can be alive, but we can be sort of just existing, which doesn't quite seem like a good idea either. 
I have a couple of links here for you that actually start to give a little bit more to the picture of the studies of longevity, as well as some of the changes we are seeing. Some specific things here on these quotes or these links that I want you to start to reflect on is this is the part when people have heard me speak, I usually start with the Debbie Downer bad news before we get into the what you can do about it good news side of things. So please bear with me as I kind of bum you all out on this beautiful Saturday morning. So why do you think that we are under the impression that we're healthy today? in this room especially, of people who are very thought conscious and health conscious and actually are looking at optimizing versus just reducing symptoms. I think part of it is our system, our medical system is sort of up against us. But there's also this sort of illusion that we are all just granted the gift of health and longevity without any work on our part, without any responsibility on our part. And we also take for granted that we've also contributed to a very ailing and sick planet around us. And it doesn't matter where you live anymore, in the world to be affected by the changes that we've made in a very short period of time to this beautiful big blue ball that we call home, all right? And so when we look at some of the longevity studies here, despite our modern technologies, our medical infrastructures, our access to medical care, clean water and hygiene, and in the United States, we spend more on healthcare annually than most of the countries combined worldwide, and yet we're number, I think, 38th now in mortality rates in the world, or excuse me, in um, uh, healthcare rates in the world. So we fall far behind other developed countries and developing countries even with regards to our overall um, well-being and healthcare system. But what's very interesting to me and what some of these studies are showing you is for the last three years, longevity in the United States, this is very specific to the US, is falling. Where the rest of the world, including developing countries, that aren't really changing or improving upon their infrastructure or their medical technologies are actually starting to gain in longevity. In fact, the average age span today is 80.3 years worldwide. That's a big change over the past 100 years, thanks to a lot of medical interventions such as antibiotics, emergency surgeries, cardiovascular surgeries, surgeries. But really notice those are more in the acute emergency environments that we've been able to make a dent in our longevity. And yet in the United States, we are slipping. We're about a, a year and a half to two years behind the rest of the world's um, improving survival rates. We're about 77.6% in survival compared to the 80.3% worldwide. And so why in the wealthiest country, in the, the, the highest medical interventions out there, is this changing? So before we dive into that, the longevity researchers, the World Health Organization, state these are the nine factors that impact our longevity. So gender, gender is one. Women, historically, a few hundred years ago, actually um, did not live as long as men, thanks to issues around maternal, you know, so childbirth and childbearing and subsequent side effects and issues of complications from childbirth. But in the last hundred years, women have exceeded men in our survival rates, and it doesn't take much beyond looking at a couple YouTube videos to probably explain why. <laughs> we do not quite have the same daredevil gene as the rest of you. That's one of the theories. And we also have a tendency to commune better with each other. We like to get our oxytocin on by um, hanging out with the gals and taking girl weekends. Community, as you'll see, is another key player here, and men tend to isolate much more where women tend to commune. Genetics. Steve talked a little bit about some of the genetics. Other folks have talked about genetics at this conference this weekend. Things like the FOXO, the CERT, 1 and 2s, the sirtuins, insulin growth factors, mTOR, PIK3. These are some of the big genes that we're monitoring and um, learning about for even folks like the centurarians who are those folks living above the age of 100. They tend to have some interesting uh, genetic findings on their FOXOs and their um, sirtuins. Um, so these are just some things we're talking about, but it really accounts for less than 25% um, of the whole role of longevity, and really our dietary and lifestyle interventions change those responses pretty drastically. Prenatal and childhood conditions play a role in this, so if you did not have good prenatal care, if there was uh, prenatal stress, if there was poor nutrition, 
those are really big factors, but how many of you are also aware of the ACE score, the Adverse Childhood Event Score? Glad to see a few hands go up. We're actually seeing some really interesting studies in the last 20 years or so and picking up momentum on the fact that we really do um, increase our risk of all mortality and all chronic illness when you've been exposed to three or more traumatic events before the age of 18. 64% of the, of the United States has had at least one traumatic event on that ACE score questionnaire, which you could easily Google, ACE, Adverse Childhood Event Score, and take that 10 questionnaire for yourself and see how many yeses you get. Because that isn't a, oh, I'm really in trouble, I have you know, seven out of 10. That's, wow, I have a lot of work to still do on healing the trauma and changing the trauma expression in my own physiology to enhance my longevity. Marital status, though many of my cancer patients over the years would tell you that their longevity increased when they had a spousectomy, but we have found in the studies that um, overall marital status does improve your uh, longevity. Socioeconomic status for some of the obvious reasons, education, there's been a lot of um, sort of showing that your education also goes hand in hand with your socioeconomic status. Ethnicity, interesting in immigration status, more based on the host and the home country at the time of like whatever current events are going on, whether it's a war or something else, those will have impact on longevity. Lifestyle. This is where we all shine, and frankly, I think it um, uh, is imp impacted by and upon all of the other eight factors here. And then the medical technology, we kind of give a lot more credence to this, but those are where I was saying that we've made some improvements in the last 100 years from emergency care. But what I want you to hear, and what will kind of linger on this, this slide for a little bit longer, is the reason why the United States is failing in our longevity compared to the rest of the world. Do any of you feel like you want to just shout out a single one of the answers for why that may be? Okay, I love hearing that. Anything else? So one of the, one of the participants here said correctly, opiate epidemic is one of the causes of our, of our survival issues. And the other one is suicide. And what scientists and the longevity um, researchers are starting to call this disease, this syndrome that's plaguing the longevity in the United States is one of despair. So I think about the perfect example of this beautiful, pristine place that I call home in Durango, Colorado. We have in Colorado, in Durango, in this particular county, the highest rate of suicide nationally. And it's not in your disenfranchised, not in your ma male, not in your single, not in your poor patients. It's in 40-something white, moderate to highly affluent, educated married women. Yeah, pretty creepy. And when we look at the, the disease of despair, People like Dr. Don Lamont was so perfect in, in bringing this up this morning. It's all about disconnect. Disconnect from self and from other. That's ultimately what cancer is. That's ultimately what all chronic illness is. And that's ultimately what despair leads to, or leads to despair. But what else might lead to despair? And what else might be contaminating kind of the bucket of who we are today that might make or break our success? of living long and healthfully on this planet. And, and notice I say healthfully along with long. So quantity as well as quality is key. Because we don't really want to spend the last 10, 20 years of our lives you know, strapped to a hospital bed not knowing who we are. I don't personally want that for myself or any of my loved ones. And I would hope and pray that none of you feel the same. But when I look at the, the contributors to this process that has really changed a lot of things, such as what Steve talked about this morning on our own internal endocannabinoid system. So the lack of or the loss of bliss and damage to our anandamide receptors in our bodies, which changes our ability to feel joy, to feel pleasure, to feel connection, is directly related to lots of things we've done to our world in the last hundred years and definitely since the Industrial Revolution and definitely since World War II as we exposed ourselves to way more sugar 
than we've ever been humanly exposed to. Way more toxicants and chemicals that were never even on this planet before, and way more changes to the way we process our food. But also our technologies. I put that under the exposures to large chemicals as well. Blue lights, for crying out loud. Um, the, the circadian rhythm loss because of all the screen time. These are major contributions to what has changed our internal chemistry in relationship to ourselves, to the listening of our cells one by one, and to the communication of our cells to the larger organism and to those around us has changed drastically. So how do I start this process when I am working with a patient or a colleague to teach them how to assess their patient? I liken this to a bucket. We all have our own mitochondrial bucket. Okay, and so what I help people do is look inside the bucket. What drops are, can, are adding to or taking away from the health and vitality of your bucket? So those might be in any of these trains. So I'm really happy by this, oh, by the way, a little side note. Somehow, in all my 28 years of working with integrative oncology, I've got pegged as the keto girl. And yet, if you really know me and you took a chance to know me and know what I talk about, I talk about a lot of things. <laughs> I talk about a lot of the con contributions to what makes our mitochondria hum or ha. And many of those things do not relate just to the diet. They relate to our hormones. They relate to our epigenetics. They relate to our um, circadian rhythms. They relate to our stress response, our mental emotional state and our trauma history, to our oxygenation to all of these things, if you, if you just focus entirely on only one drop in the bucket, you're never gonna change the bucket, all right? And when people sit there and think that there's one cause or one cure, that's dangerous thinking. That's just the way we're wired, I think, in our world. Um, oh my word, that went really fast. But ultimately, on the mitochondria, where I wanna focus for you is these amazing little organelles within our bodies are also in charge of our aging process. All right, I wanna focus there. Because it's when the cells start to de degenerate, thanks to whatever it is that we're putting inside that bucket, that's what speeds up our aging process. That is directly what's related to our longevity, is based on the health, the function, the efficiency, the number, the communication of, and the relationship of our mitochondria to the rest of the systems and tissues and organs and cells of our body, and to the bodies that are around us. And when we look at early warning signs of mitochondrial health, and we think about the despair that's plaguing our world today, our nation today, you might already recognize these symptoms in yourself, or in your patient population, or the folks that you're coaching, but ultimately, Many of our younger generations are total night owls who live on caffeine, who are plugged into all of the data devices but have no idea how to go camping <laughs> or to actually be with another human being. And they start to feel stressed and anxious and their only outlet is social media, which gives you an opportunity to mask up and be whatever you need to be or say whatever you need to say without truly being true to yourself and to another. And then when we look at the leader warning signs of mitochondrial damage. This is unfortunately when they come to see folks like me, or Dr. Rob, or some of the others, Dr. Don in this room. That's when we start to see extreme mental and physical fatigue, pain, slow recovery from exertion, foggy brain, dizzy spells. All of these, this basically starts to lead to an absolute lack of joy and gratitude and passion and purpose in your life. And this is what starts to lead to the despair that ultimately while we're slowly killing the health and vitality of our individual mitochondria, that starts to hijack the rest of the organism to start to make different choices in how they nourish or nurture themselves or interact with another. So there are a couple ways for you to assess your own mitochondrial status and that of the people you love. You could take one of those insurance guided longevity calendars, because they're trying to sell you insurance, and they're also trying to see your risk to benefit ratio of insuring somebody like you, but it's pretty helpful. Um, I'm gonna be 105, apparently, um, shooting for higher. Um, in my family, I have, just in my close blood circle, four centurions and dozens of octogenarians in my own family, so I know it's possible um, to, to have that experience in my family of origin, but if you didn't have that, you can create it. 
That's important to know. The other one that I won't show you, but I can do it, I practiced it in the bathroom this morning just to prove that I could, because I'm not gonna do this with my dress on. But how many of you have tried to sit, cross your legs from a standing position, sit down on the floor, and then stand back up without hands? Cool. In fact, I'm gonna probably make you all do it on the question and answer, because it's actually a marker of longevity. And I would love for Daryl to have been in here to hear this, but ultimately it's people like Daryl who teach us the flexibility and adaptability in our day-to-day -day movement that also enhances the flexibility and adaptability of our mitochondria. And even what Dawn spoke about this morning about the flexibility and the adaptability of our entire organism to handle the stressors coming at us because we can't seemingly slow that down right now but we can start to strengthen what we put in our own bucket. We can start to strengthen our own bodies and our own minds in increasing upon this. But just a few other tests that I run pretty much across the board in every patient to assess their own um, flexibility, basically, is things like you can run something called a mito swab. Now, the best test for your mitochondrial health is basically testing a muscle biopsy, but I'm not going to recommend you all run out and do that. It's painful, <laughs> okay? So the next best, about an 84% accuracy, is a mitoswab test. So you can actually see um, how you're impacting the health of, and vitality of your mitochondria. A simple lactase dehydrogenase test can also give you a good idea of how your mitochondria are functioning. The higher it is, the more turned off your mitochondria are. And insulin, as Steve alluded to with the endocannabinoid system and many other things, we're finding that insulin is kind of a, a nasty beast if it's not controlled properly and not balanced properly. And hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance are absolutely things that are gonna rust your interior and age your mitochondria much faster. So looking at some of those things and assessing your own terrain, looking inside the bucket, see what's in there possibly poisoning your cells is really powerful. And then another really fun one is there's a couple of visual acuity tests that you can do for free online because some of the first signs and symptoms of our mitochondrial being damaged are changes in our vision. And while we're all panicking as we're putting on our readers, like I have mine up here, that's thanks to all the blue light and the screen time. That's also directly damaging the bucket of our mitochondria. And so folks like Dr. Perlmutter have basically said, and this group around me have said, we can do something about it. And so when we look at the longevity, I call it my own version of the CDC. Okay, forget about the centers of disease control. Let's talk about the centers of circadian rhythm, dietary interventions, and community. Two weeks ago, I was hanging out for 10 days in the Mediterranean on an island called Paros in Greece. I've been to this place four times. When I arrived for my Airbnb, the woman who greeted me, Elvira, when we started talking about what I was here doing for a conference, she just kind of giggled. 82 years old, sprite as can be super full of joy and zest. She grew up in Ikaria, Greece, which is one of the famous blue zones. And without me even prompting her, she started in to basically how she lives and why she's going to make it well above 100 like those in her island, and why she's worried for her children and grandchildren living in London, completely living the antithesis to the Ikaria lifestyle. And so I won't go into the circadian rhythm discussion because we had a beautiful talk with Dr. Party on this, but really just know we're all way out of rhythm. For any of you who ever saw the movie The Jerk, Steve Martin, we have no rhythm, okay? <laughs> it's really bad, but we can always train ourselves to get back into rhythm, to reset our circadian rhythm. In fact, it's such an important piece that we won a Nobel Prize in the sciences for it in 2017. This has implications in all of our aging and health um, and disease prevention. This has also been talked about a lot this weekend, and if you want to hear my talk from Ancestral Health or from Low Carb USA last weekend, you can. I did an entire hour presentation on intermittent fasting and all the different ways to do this because we were never meant to every day eat in a 16, you know, fast for 16 hours, or every day be in ketosis, or every day intermittent fast for 13 hours. We've always mixed it up just by the needs and nature around us. But look at all the things that are free, that a bit of intermittent fasting woven into your diet and lifestyle can bring to the table. Interestingly enough, all the research around Mediterranean diet being so powerful, what we've actually are starting to uncover is the real issue where these studies were done was based on Greek Orthodox spirituality. 
200 days a year fasting. So really, is it so much about what we were eating? It was likely more about when we were eating and how we were never ever meant to be grazing 24 seven every day of the year and to shake it up seasonally and in the rhythm of what your body needs at different times. And the final of the, of the other C is the community. Finding that, finding your joy, your gratitude, your purpose, volunteering, coming to conferences like this and hanging out with your tribe. These are the things that bring us back to balance. And in real time, not over a, a Facebook page or an Instagram share, your value is not based on how many likes you get on your Instagram. Your value is how you can connect with another while you're exchanging pleasantries standing in the line at the grocery store. Some of those moments are the moment that's gonna keep that person from going home and killing themselves that day. And when we think about the eight factors of the blue zones, when you look at eight factors of the blue zones and the nine factors of longevity and the nine factors of radical remission from Kelly Turner, a friend and colleague of mine, what I want you to see is that it's not so much about what you take. There's so many cool biohacks of supplements and blue blocking glasses and cool technologies, which are fun, believe me, I love them, I have them all. But the main factors, the main commonalities in all of these come down to a very mental, emotional, and spiritual side. How do you show up for yourself and how do you show up for those that you care about? And how do you show up for those you don't even know on the planet today? And when I finish off with any patient I'm working with or colleague that I'm educating on how to nurture that bucket, how to assess, test, and address what's in that bucket and how to change the outcomes and overcome the statistics and add to your personal shelf life, these are the little handouts I give to help remind people of the basics. These are things that each of us can improve upon every single day, that each of us can share and inspire in one another. And then the take home points changed a lot in a very short period of time of our evolutionary moment on this planet, our hiccup on this planet. Our mitochondria are at the heart of this continuum. There are many factors that contribute to this, but really the big ones might live in the CDC, an improved upon upgraded version of the CDC. And really, sometimes the best things in life are free. And finally, what I've told my patients for over 25 years, if you ignore your health, it will go away. And so a bunch of gnarly, deep-rooted um, uh, research for you, which is really fun for me. And um, my mentor, one of my uh, pre predecessors in, um, in the lineage of naturopathic medicine, Henry Linlar, said that there are two ways of treating disease. One is combative which is frankly how we do things today in Western medicine, and the other is preventative. And really the only cure for any disease and any ailment and, and prevent, to pre preventing the inevitable or at least slowing down the inevitable is through prevention. And with that, I thank you so much for your time. Please come up. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I know you guys probably have a bunch of questions, so please come up here. And I know you guys look a little stunned right now. <laughs> Hi, this is just a quick question, and I've been catching the door, so I hope I didn't miss this. Okay. Um, it was my understanding that um, marriage uh, and longevity is more beneficial for men than it is women. And I just wanted to know if you wanted to count. <laughs> that, is, that is true. And if you were stepped out for the moment, I actually said that I have a lot of patients, mostly, I would probably say all women, would attest to your first comment that there's um, some pretty profound longevity I've seen with somebody with a terminal diagnosis who actually did have a husbandectomy. So. Okay. <laughs> and, and just so you understand, there's no way I could have stepped out of this, but I'm, I'm the door catcher. Oh, I know. Oh, to absolutely. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. This is, was wonderful. We Thank were adapting you. with you. It's all okay. good. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank good. You. Thank you. Thanks. I know there's some other juicy questions out there. Yeah. I have uh, looked into the blue zones. And one thing that they all have in common, although researchers never ask the question, is they do fasting. As you hit upon it, a lot of it's religion. Yeah. But other, it's just they think it's healthy. Exactly. And yeah. uh, I don't know why 
researchers never ask the question, do you fast? Yeah. But they don't seem to. I love that you reiterated that because when I look at the literature about Mediterranean diet and you look at blue zones, everyone gets hung up on plant-based diet, plant-based diet. I'm here to tell you for 25 years I've been traveling to Greece, these people eat a large amount of lamb <laughs> and a large amount of fish and a large amount of dairy and eggs everywhere, especially on the islands. That is their sustenance. Or in uh, Italy, Mediterranean diet, large amount of veal. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, and it's funny because that's the region also, the, the whole fertile crescent through the Mediterranean is also where the HLA-DQ gene came to be when we moved through the fertile crescent of, um, you know, moving it from hunter-gatherer into agriculture. And ironically, that's the highest rate of celiac in the world <laughs> because of that little gene hiccup. So their, their diet is not because they're eating proper amounts of uh, bread and pasta. So <laughs> thank you for reading that. Hi. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank I you. wonder if you have an opinion on red light and near infrared photobiomodulation as it pertains to mitochondrial health. Yes, yes. So I, I love these. That's why I was saying up here. I love to play with all the biohack type of things. And I've personally seen it myself in using some of those therapies, as well as patients, especially patients who've had um, known mitochondrial disease, even from DNA mitochondrial diseases in pediatrics. Okay, I've actually seen unbelievable stabilization uh, and breakdown where children were expected to be dead by three or five years old, who are now 12, 15 years old. I've also seen it be very powerful in regeneration of nerve function. Like I just had a woman who had a mastectomy and lost all of her nerve function and was using a juve light and it completely restored her nerve function. Uh, her numbness went away, which all of her doc medical team said it would never go away. And a lot of this in especially brain trauma environments. So yeah, there's something to it for sure. And again, I think about when we go back to taking it to nature, first light of the day and last light of the day, very high in that red frequency. So go outside. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Hi. Thank you, doctor. Thank That's you. great. Thank um, you. How do you feel about the role of cities and just urban versus rural living when you look at the despair epidemic that's mm apparently the most prevalent in America, yeah. sounds like. Yeah, you know, n nature deficit disorder is a thing. And even in the studies that show urban environments that are very, you know, concrete jungle-like, even if somebody is working in an office that has a plant or they're looking out over a green space, they actually seem to have nice, you know, responses. Their chemistries and they're checking their physiology can, can hold its own pretty well just by even knowing nature is close at hand. Um, there's a lot of movement in urban and city environments to basically, you know, kind of bring nature into that environment. There's that exact concept we talked about a little bit here, the adaptability and the flexibility. And then I believe that no matter what sort of problems we're handed, we can sort of adapt and overcome them in a variety of, of ways. So if you are someone who lives in a concrete jungle, please get container gardens or pots of plants in your home. Please maybe join a CSA or maybe help put a rooftop garden in your community or take over your neighbor's front yard and build some, you know, put in some gardens today. These are some simple things of starting to uh, bring nature back into the urban environments. And I'm loving seeing movements of that happening. Like you've probably seen like the food truck movements where people are taking kind of old broken down jalopy pickups and turning them into gardens and taking them around parts of, of cities that otherwise don't are, you know, food deserts. So, yeah, anything you want to add to that or is that? I mean, I completely agree. Cool. And just background, I'm from Alaska, but I live in New York City. So I definitely <laughs> have, I've seen both spectrums. Um, oh, yeah, you have. How about the social aspect, though? Because, you know, you look at a city like New York or L.A. and you're surrounded by literally millions of people. Yeah. Um, and I don't know the data, but is the data for those large cities is the despair and the feelings of loneliness higher there, or is it actually in rural communities? They're actually higher in urban communities. Okay. And I think there's just that belief system, like, well, how could you possibly be alone with millions of people? And so it's sort of like we either, number one, take it for granted, or we even sort of self-isolate to protect ourselves from all that energy around us all the time, or we just have lost touch with, because of the nature of how things are stacked up and we, the way we live, we don't have our porches anymore. Steve and I talk about this a lot 
where we live, it's like no one sits on the front porch. Everyone drives into their garage and goes in through that way. You don't even know your neighbor. So it's those rural communities that allow, when we could do our house calls as doctors, you know, when you go in and you see how someone's living, you look in there, and by the way, I do look in your pantry and your medicine cabinet and under your sink um, when I go to your houses, so just be forewarned. Um, because that's how we got to know people. They couldn't just tell us what we wanted to hear. And so a lot of people who kill themselves, right, you don't know until after. So we miss a lot of those signs and symptoms. But when you're around someone really with somebody, really present, you see very different stories. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a report showing a correlation between uh, centenarians and blue zones and lack of birth records. Um, oh, interesting. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the reliability of the data from... That's interesting. Well, you know, just because I've been hanging out in Greece for 25 years, um, I've definitely met people that are far older than dirt, and, um, that I've watched this particular family, multiple generations come and go. And what I've watched that's very interesting is never cancer at all in this family that I've been visiting for many years. And their youngest daughter was just diagnosed with breast cancer in her 20s. She lives in Athens. Right? And she moved to Athens right out of college to go and do what everybody does who leaves these small rural communities. And within a very short period of time, cancer that had never been there before is alive and well in her. When we start to look at things like that, yes, there's probably some birth records piece, but there's also good historians and family, you know, uh, what all those ancestry DNAs and whatnot, we can trace things back quite a bit. I really do think um, that you know, obviously we want to explore this a little bit more, but I don't think that we can get that as much power as it's sort of presented. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And, you know, again, I, I, I'm a Kansas girl through and through. My great-grandmother was 103. My other great-grandmother was 101. My great-aunt would have been uh, 100, but Biox took her out too soon. Um, my other grandmother was 98, uh, 93, and um, Cipro took her out too soon. So I look at some of these women, and my Aunt Grace was 109. She learned how to swim when she was 88. She learned how to drive when she was 92. I love that. She went through Colorado in a covered wagon, for crying out loud. I mean, this is the, this is the fabric in which I come from, which is probably why it's really hard to kill me. If you know anything about my history, I should be dead many times over um, with my own BRCA genes and whatnot, um, all the longevity pieces, and I'm definitely a mammoth woman with lots of insulin growth factor um, and should not be here. But I also inhale life very much like the Blue Zone people do, and I very much thrive on connection with another. And I think that that really plays a much bigger role than probably any supplement or dietary intervention that we can make. So thanks for bringing that up. Right on. Hi. Um, I'd like to know what's your thoughts on, like, um, grain regarding, like, brown rice, wild rice, and legumes uh, in regarding to longevity, like, sure. part of the blue zone, like, yeah. in Loma Linda. Yeah. What's your thoughts? You know, I think um, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it had a very different, it was a different animal. Uh, but today, because things like Roundup, don't know signs that say organic. Um, it, it spreads two miles by air, two miles by soil, and God knows how far in groundwater. Um, the, the crops that sequester things like Roundup and its other uh, dastardly chemicals that we don't even talk about yet, um, sequesters in legumes and grains worldwide. And so there are no places left on the planet where it's really ideal that you aren't spraying crops um, somewhere in those regions to ripen crops for you know, helping uh, our bottom dollar. And so places where, for instance, when I first went to India in early 90s, cancer was basically very rare, very unheard of. Diabetes was just starting to pick up, but this is a culture for tens of thousands of years has eaten pulses, and like, you know, just it's been part of it. But today, we have farmers killing themselves in droves because of people like Monsanto coming in and saying, oh, we tested your crop and it has our gene in it, so therefore we own your crop now, carry on. And so they're killing themselves because of having their livelihoods taken by big corporations. But they're probably also killing themselves because they're damaged in their mitochondrial bucket from being exposed to those things on a regular basis. But the foods that sustained and nourished us for tens of thousands of years, we've changed. We've changed those foods. And we have to adapt and change with that. And so my, some of my largest population are Southeast Asian population who've eaten certain ways forever. But I don't guess and I don't be dogmatic, I test. So when I see elevated insulin, insulin growth factor, hemoglobin A1C, super low vitamin D levels, um, off the charts, 
uh, HDG levels, off the charts, Roundup levels, because I check urine, uh, urinary glyphosate levels in all my patients. The only place it could be coming from in those populations is from their grains and their legumes. So we have to change that out. So it's not that those foods are inherently bad, it's what we've done to them. And I think that's where the conversation needs to change. Thank you, thanks. Not much fun at parties. <laughs> that's my big sign. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Nisha, again. Thanks, Let's everybody. Give another round of applause. Thank you.